Oh, let me start the recording. OK, uh, so so I'm taking a look at the uh, the slides that I had put up for today and uh, I won't go in depth. I won't go into the uh, testing strategy slide. I'll hold that off for for a future uh, course, future um, sorry, future uh, meeting. Uh, so today we will talk about uh, functional testing and I may introduce some of the testing strategy stuff, some of the early stuff in those slides, but I won't uh, spend a great deal of time on that. Uh, but one other thing I do want to make sure, and I'm just cleaning some stuff up in the slides right now. I just realized there was some formatting stuff that I didn't like. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to make sure, I wanted to announce, I wanted to let you know is that next week uh, we won't have an afternoon meeting. Uh, so we uh, so we won't get together next uh, Friday afternoon. I may record something like I may record the uh, the testing strategies stuff uh, like on a separate day and then post that video. Uh, but the next time we'll get together after today uh, live will be uh, January 8th because uh, we'll, we'll take off next week. Then the following week is New Year's Day uh, and then the week after that we'll get we'll uh, meet again okay so let's see go ahead and share functional testing stuff all right now well some of the stuff that we've talked about uh like last week we talked about structural testing and it had to do with uh, some of the design of how to determine how many test cases uh, we needed at minimum and stuff like that. And functional testing, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the purposes of testing and, and how to make some of those testing, how to make some of those test cases, and how to be uh, wise about making sure that we test the things that we need to test. So, uh, and there's includes an example about a simple program where the what we're supposed to do is determine whether uh, three numbers can make a triangle and what kind of triangle they make. Uh, and so we'll go over some of the testing uh, situations for that. OK, so. One of the things is like so functional testing is a type of black box testing. It can also be known as behavioral testing. It, it's uh, something that we want to make sure that the specification, the requirements, uh, and then the design specs that it is followed. Uh, and so we'll need test cases to give some inputs to our to what we're testing and draw out some outputs. OK, now there's a different levels of pest purposes of testing. So one of the things that we've said, I've said <laughs> plenty of times uh, during the course of this semester is I've talked about how one that testing cannot be used to prove that something works. Uh, the one another thing that I talked about was that the purpose of testing uh, was to try to find places where it doesn't work. And uh, one other thing was I said it's very poor if we only write test cases that are the the uh, let's see some of the phrasing we've used is the golden path or the true path testing, where we only test <coughs> we only test things uh, that we know will pass. Uh, and that's a bad way to test in general. But what you'll see on this slide was so, you, so you'll think on this slide, it's like, wait a second, this is contradicting things that you've said. You know, make sure that the software works. Don't push it to the limit. Apply simple tests. Don't find bugs. But notice the very last bullet point on this is that we do this test first. <coughs> so. This is this would be the kind of testing you might do on if you had a um, a prototype. So if you made a prototype of a system, you might do this kind of testing on the prototype. Uh, or you just kind of very simply you want to show that it that the software basically works. So you don't put bad inputs into the system. You don't put uh, string types of in uh, of uh, of values 
when it's expecting numbers, right? So you see, so you don't do that on this level of testing. This is the stuff that basically is the simple test. It should be done very quickly. And we expect this to pass. So basically what we what we know is that if this testing results in failures, like we know, OK, we've got some big problems that we need to go figure out why even the simple test that isn't supposed to be pushing our system to the limit. Why are those failing? And so these these tests are done kind of like through a surface level, you know, um, minimal stuff to make sure that uh, the simple stuff works first. OK, then after we do the, the, the first round of testing, the, first, the tests that are intended to make sure it passed. So, oh, well, let me let me give you this. This would be the kind of test that so when you go and start looking for those of you who may have already looked, but I've uh, uploaded these uh, test cases, uh, JUnit test case files from the 101 course <clears throat> that I used. And what you'll see in there is that some of those test cases come directly from the assignment description. So I say, you know, test that we put this value in and we get this value out. Right, and it's directly from the assignment description. This would be this kind of level of testing. So this would be like, um, so let me say, let me let me kind of show it like this. This would be like if we said we want a method that adds two numbers. Okay, and I said as an example, if I say uh, the method is called sum, and I say I pass it three and five it should return eight okay now if some student if some student wrote this okay and I have a test case based on three and five. You know, this would pass my test case, right? So this is one of those things where it's like, OK, so I'm going to I'm going to test the things that I said. These are examples, right? I'm going to test that just to make sure that it, it really at least does the bare minimum, at least works on that level. But then, you know, if I give a value like And it also returns in this in this particular programmer's solution. It also returns eight. Right, that's going to be a problem. That should that I, I should have another test case test case later that will check this value that will check a test case like this. So so let me go ahead and do this. All right, so. This test to pass mentality, that's this kind of thing. That's this. We're going to test the value that we said. This is an example. OK. That other one, the six, seven one, that would be more of this test to fail. OK, so after we do the test to pass type stuff. After. Right. After we do the test to pass stuff, we then want to do the test to fail. All you gotta do is wait for everyone else to So what test to fail is is more a little bit is more rigorous. It's what we want to do to try to find problems in the software if they are there. Right? We want to know where are the weaknesses. So if we know where weaknesses are, where there are some potential problems. Right, we want to know that there's a problem. That we, we want to know that um, um, we want to know to make sure to test that. So back to my sum example. Uh, so if we were to pass in, uh, uh, what is the max int? It's like a method that gives us the integer, the max int. What is that? Uh, yeah. Max value. 
So if I gave it something like this, if I passed it in, right? The calling of this method should give me no problem. Right? The calling of this method should give me a problem because this is a this is a valid integer value. This is a valid integer value. Um, but if I try to add them together, I'll get an overflow, right? And so we want to, this would be one of the, right? So we do want to try to see, okay, what's going to happen if we, if we, if we do this, all right? And what does the specification say should happen? Should it get, should it generate an exception? Should it return, uh, something else, you know, should it return some other value? All right, what do the specifications say? Okay. There's also, so if the specification says that something like this should generate an exception, an overflow exception, then that would be an example of a forced error test. So we want to force an error to make sure that the error happens. Okay. Okay. Again, we talked about black box testing, what that is. So we, um, we just we don't know what's inside, and so we're designing the test cases to make sure that our requirements are met. And, we're, and we, um, we don't know what's inside the code when we write these test cases. Um, and so uh, when you look at those examples of the JUnit test cases that I gave you, uh, what you'll see is that some of those test cases, like when I, when I run those tests on a student's submission, I don't look at the student's code first. I'm just running the test and I'm making sure that what I put in is what I and what I get out are correct. All right. Okay. And a rand and one thing a good point here is a randomly selected set of test cases is statistically insignificant. We don't want to just our sum method, right? We want to make sure that we generate a set of test cases based on the facts of how the system was supposed to work. And we'll see that in the triangle example. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so some of the types of errors that we might look for are listed here. Take a look at those. You know, and some of the questions that we're designing our test cases to answer, right? Uh, okay. Some of the goals, you know. We want to produce test cases that reduce the overall all number of test cases, right? The the point here, the point this is trying to make is is that we don't want to test everything. We can't we can't possibly test everything. So we need to test a subset of the potential inputs, right? But we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to over test. Like we don't want to because each time we run a test case that costs time. So we want to make sure that if there's two test cases that both are kind of testing the same thing, right? Two, like in the sum example, we want two positive numbers that we add together and get a positive number. We want two negative numbers that add together and get a negative number. We want a negative number and a positive number that add together and get a negative, a negative and a positive that add together and get a positive, right? And we want to uh, have the sum method be tested to make sure that if we have uh, a negative number and a positive number add together and they're the same value, same absolute value, and, they, and we get zero. Right. These are all some examples of things that we could test lots of things. We could test lots of examples in those classes, but if we test one of those classes, right, one, two, two, two values that fall into one of those classes, we don't have to test other numbers that also fall into that class. All right. So, yeah. So let's talk about yeah. So let's talk about some of these methods that get us to be able to not over test. All right. Again, it's impossible to test all cases. All right. So, an example might be if we have the equivalence partitioning. It's an example might be if we have an if statement. If x equals fifteen, then do something else. Do that. You know. So, an, a partition would be. We need to test something in the range between negative infinity and 15, 15 itself, and then something in the range of 15 to positive infinity. We basically really, at bare minimum, we need to test one value from this partition, 
one value from this partition and one value from this partition. Now this partition consists of one value, so we need to test 15, but we, we could test 10, we could test 20, and we could test 15, and we would know that we got all three of these partitions. Okay, and so that drastically reduces our number of test cases from infinity, infinite number of test cases down to three, okay, which is a much, much better and more uh, easily done set of test cases for our testers to accomplish. So some other possible equivalence partitions, if we had a file name, uh, you know, we want to have a file name that consists of valid char characters. We want to have a file name that consists of some invalid characters. Uh, we want to know, OK, what's make sure we have a valid length, an invalid length. What if the file name is uh, 256 characters long? Right. So some groups for similar inputs. This would be a so the equivalence partitioning isn't just along the number line. So it's basically if you think of it as a Venn diagram, right? Where you have uh, I can I can put a symbol in here. Let's say we had this type of thing. Yeah, and you have this, and, and I'm not going to go through the whole process of making this, uh, you know, transparent and all that, but you know what this looks like, right? So you have some inputs that maybe this is a uh, file name consists of, ha file name has valid characters. This is file name has invalid characters. Now notice there's an overlap where the file name consists, has valid and invalid characters in it. So basically this partition would be only valid characters. This partition would be only invalid characters. This partition would be has a mixture of them, some of each. And we would want to test from each of those partitions. Valid length, where if you have. This would be if the if it has a valid set of characters, right now. In this particular situation, I think what we'd have is something where this was actually inside of this because I don't think you can have what's out here in invalid and valid care. Both it's both valid. It's it's neither valid nor invalid. The cares no right. So it'd be something more like this on that one, right? So it'd look like something like this, right? Where you could have a valid length that consists of valid characters only, a valid link that has a mixture, a valid link that has um, a valid link that has some inv only invalid characters. Right, and so what you would do is uh, you would pick from each region. So if each overlapping region was differently colored, what we could do is then we could pick from each region one at least one test from each region and we would feel like we've covered that partition okay. uh, some other examples here right if we don't if we have too few partitions we may not reveal all catchable bugs but again this is about the reducing the set of possible test cases because if we look at this if we say just this one circle that we talked about the set of where the file name has only valid characters how many possible file names do we have that consist of only valid characters that can be between one and 255 characters long? That's a lot, right? And so we need to reduce that. So we only want to choose one value from here to test and see what happens. OK. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, some other stuff about this equivalence partitioning stuff that I won't go into today. But the next thing is this whole is the idea of the boundary value analysis. So it's kind of similar to the partition testing in the sense that it's going to sound similar, like we talked about with the 15, right? But if, let's say something happens, like the range of expected inputs goes from 100 to 200, right? So that's an example, 100 to 200. So we want to know, OK, what's the val what happens if we enter 99, 100 
and 101. And we also want to have some sets of test cases around the upper bound, the 199, the 200, and the 201. Uh, I talked about this before, where what if there were certain, uh, like a, you went to the grocery store and you get a, a certain end of them, a certain discount for 50 lira and up and another discount for 100 lira and up. Well, you would want to test 49, 50, and 51, and you would want to test 99, 100, and 101. All right. And so uh, these would be some examples of the tests that we would want to use based on some boundary conditions. All right. And so this is some more information, some more ideas of how some types of boundary conditions, because they're not just numeric. It could be about the position. So if you were testing a searching algorithm, you would want to have the position of the thing you're searching for be at the very beginning of the array or be the very beginning of the list or whatever data structure you're using. You would want to have a test where the thing that you're looking for is at the very end of the uh, array or list. You would want to have it uh, be at the second position. You would want to have it be at the end, uh, second to last position, right? Um, you would um, want to have, so if you were doing a, uh, what is it, binary search, you might, the bound, bound, a boundary condition for the binary search might be uh, the thing is in the very middle, right? Because it's going to be the first position. And it's going to be right to the left of the very middle, and it's going to be right to the right of the very middle, and see what happens then. Um, all right. So just some different types of boundaries that aren't just along a number line. Uh, so it, some internal boundaries might be about what type of, of size, right? Uh, type of size or something uh, in an ASCII table. That's not the right spelling of ASCII, is it? All right, the boundaries are not always obvious. Uh, what about the, the null character, uh, a default value, some empty information? This would be, you know, this could be used in like a database testing and stuff like that. Uh, some in, invalid or wrong values or incorrect or garbage data, something doesn't make sense. So again, we're testing to make sure that a failure happens. Because one of the things I don't know, I can't remember right now if the test cases I gave you had examples of intentionally trying to generate an error. But if an error is expected, we want to write a test case that makes sure that an error happens, right? And so that's uh, one of those things that can be uh, uh, Difficult to do because uh, not well, not difficult to do, but difficult to understand is how do we how do we test to make sure that an error happens? And I can show you that I can I can do that. Uh, maybe I will go ahead and record this this other thing next week to help you out with that. All right, all right. Uh, so uh, the matrix of functional possibilities. This is important because some functional possibilities are some. Some of these won't have a value because it's not possible. So let's take a look at the triangle problem, the one that I talked about at the very beginning. I mentioned this. So we're going to send three floating point numbers, three double or floats, into our method. And what, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to de determine are the three numbers forming, could they form a triangle? Could they represent three sides of a triangle? If they can't, print a message, not a triangle. If it is a triangle, OK, let's classify according to the sides. You know, is it equilateral? Is it isosceles? Is it scalene? And according to the largest angle, is it acute? Is it right? Is it obtuse? OK, so then we can output the num three numbers and what the classification or, sa or say not a triangle. All right, so let's talk about some of those this matrix of possibilities. So if we say, OK, the three um, uh, what was the words? Uh, side and largest angle. OK, large largest angle could be acute, obtuse or right. And the sides could be scaling, isosceles or equilateral. OK, so. 
you might take a look at this and say, OK, well, we, need, we need nine test cases because we need to have a test case that checks for an acute scale. Oh, well, 10. No, let me rephrase that. We need 10 test cases because we need uh, we need nine for this grid and we need one for something that's not a triangle at all. OK, except. Well, let's take a look at something here. Let's. So like a little check bar check. Do we have a little fun? I want a check. Do we have a check? Ah, oh, you know what? I'll do an X. I'll do an X for the ones that can't be. Or maybe a plus for the ones that can. Let's. Okay. So can we have an acute scaling triangle? You know what? Well, wait, let me. Can you think back to your geometry days and know what a scaling triangle is? Tahir, do you remember what a scaling triangle is? Well, I well, studied, I studied in, in Turkish, so maybe it could be a triangle where all edges are equal to each other. OK, that's an equilateral triangle. So this, so this, uh, an equilateral triangle is all three sides are the same. An isosceles triangle is two of the sides are the same. And a scaling triangle is, is none of the sides are the same. They're all three different values. Okay. Okay. So can, so can we have a scaling acute triangle? I got something even better I want to do here. I'm going to do a text box because I'm going to show you why. Okay. Can we have three values? Come on. Can we have three values that are a scaling acute triangle? That th all three sides are, are different. And it's an acute triangle. Let's see. And well, I'll just tell you the answer is yes. Uh, we could come up with something like 10. Uh, 11 and 12, for example. So if we had a 10, 11, 12 triangle, that would be uh, an acute scaling triangle. Okay. okay. Obtuse. Ob oh, acute. Oh, let me. I just realized that you might not know what acute and obtuse and right triangles are. No, uh, I, I actually okay. checked. I, I checked it already. <laughs> okay. So we might have. Uh, so that that would be an acute. Like so, this, there's an angle that's small. An obtuse triangle. Yeah, sure. We could have uh, larger than ninety degree. Right. Uh, so you might have, I think, a two, three, four triangle would be an obtuse scaling triangle, uh, and then a right triangle that's scaling. Well, three, four, five is a known right triangle. All right, and all the sides are different. Right. So OK, so all three of these are possible. Now an isosceles acute. You know, we could have a 10. A 10, 12 triangle. This would be an example of an acute isosceles triangle. Uh, we could have for obtuse. We could have a, let's see, a obtuse bigger angle. What would that be? I think a th three, three, five would work. Yeah, I think that would give me an obtuse angle. Yeah, probably. 
then a right triangle. Yeah, you could have a one. This one, I'm, this one, I don't. You can't have this one without decimal. You can't have this as whole numbers. But a one one uh, square root of two triangle would be an isosceles right triangle. Okay. So now, so so far we're like, yeah, we have to write six test cases, six roots. So it seems pretty straightforward. Okay, so an acute equilateral. Yeah, all sides are the same. Yeah, okay, they're all sides are going to be 60 degrees. Sure. So we could do a uh, one, 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 right? Or a two, 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 or a three, 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 anything like that, right? But now, what about this one? What about the obtuse? This isn't possible. You can't have an equilateral obtuse triangle, right? Because all six yeah. sides are equal. All six sides are going to have 60 degrees. All, the, all three angles are going to have 60 degrees. So you can't have an obtuse. So what was the symbol I was going to use here? Maybe this right here, right? You can't have that there. We also can't have this either. You cannot have an equilateral right triangle. So we need to write, so we can't write test cases for this. This, because this is not a possible output. We do need to write these seven test cases, and we will need to write some other thing like um, the not a triangle example would be uh, not a not a triangle at all. Uh, one, two, three, for example, would be something that could not be a triangle. Because if this if one side was one, one side was two, they, you know, or maybe even more obvious would be like a one, two, four, where you cannot have a one side of one, one side of two, and another side of four. That's that's not a possible triangle configuration. Okay. Right, so we write these. So at our minimum, what we're looking at is we would look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, and this this um, matrix here, the matrix of functional possibilities, helped us see some of the possible test cases that we wouldn't have to write. Right, and it's and it helps us understand some of the possible values we can have as well. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. So that's that's about it for this set of slides. Uh, let me pull up. Let me see if there was anything on testing strategies I wanted to. Yeah, I do want to talk about. Well, yeah, you know what? I am going to go ahead and talk a little bit about testing strategies, and then we'll finish, and then we'll then we'll complete them uh, next time. Okay. So the idea about the the testing strategies is basically what we're talking about is not just randomly testing. Like we talked about just now, we talked about having a systematic approach to coming up with some potential test cases. Now, again, that was a bare minimum, right? That was a, uh, we want to uh, make sure that we have something in each of those categories, some test case that is in each, each of those categories. Uh, we might want to, uh, we might want to come up uh, an example, uh, back to the previous one, an example of a boundary condition would be that one, two, three uh, input. Because here, here, let me show you what I meant by the, the one, two, three can't be. So if we have this line, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and make it thicker as well so that you can see it. OK, so let's say we had I'm going to make a one, two. OK, so this is a two. So OK, so this is a line of one. This is a line of two. 
This is a line of three. OK, and notice that I cannot make a triangle out of these three lines. Because if I tried to, there wouldn't be enough. There wouldn't be a gap, right? This just barely doesn't make it. Now, even if I just said, OK, fine, I'll make this 2.1 instead. Now I do have a possibility to make a triangle. Right. I mean, I unfortunately PowerPoint won't allow me to keep the line segment the same length and, and rotate it. I don't think. Does it allow me to rotate it? If you That's, can put it inside a text box, you can rotate, I think, in text yeah, box. Yeah, maybe so. You know, I just don't think I'm, I think it's, I think I'm asking for more uh, more than I want to do at this point. But but you get the idea that if this is just a little bit bigger, if the two if the sum of these two is just a little bit bigger than this value here, then I can make a triangle out of it. All right, it's a very thin triangle, but it's still a triangle. All right, but this would be a boundary condition. One, two, three would be a boundary condition. All right, and slightly above that would be 1.1, 2, and 3, or 1, 2.1, and 3. And then slightly below that would be 1, 2, 3.1. All right, still not a triangle, but it's on the other side of that boundary condition. Okay, so this would be an example of some boundary conditions here. All right. So in, we, we, you've seen this diagram before. <clears throat> I've shown this to you before. This idea of taking the uh, different types of testing based on what we are testing. So we write the code, we do this unit testing, and then we build on that into integration testing where we take different units and put them together, and then we do system-wide testing. Right. Some different types of this would be a testing strategy based on a uh, outside in kind of spiral uh, software process. Right. Um, we kind of drill down into the code and then we test, we drill out to test. Right. Okay. So what we are testing when we are doing system testing is we're testing the, the to the, all the system. Validation tests, we may be doing, <clears throat> we're testing the requirements to make sure that we satisfied the requirements appropri appropriately. The integration test is testing the design of the system when we put it together. The unit test is testing the individual code, even down to individual methods. And so integration testing is all about putting the systems together and testing them. But even that, there's different types of ways that we can do this integration testing. So if we look at the way that a, a component hierarchy might be put together, where A is our, in a simple university classroom example, A would be your main method in a Java program. B, C, and D would be methods that the main method calls. E and F would be a methods that B calls. G would be a method that D calls. Okay. So the question is, how do we test and make sure that all this is working well, that this is that this is being done, right? Well, there's a couple of different approaches. One is called one we're going to talk about the Big Bang integration. One is the bottom up, top down, and then the, another one called Sandwich, which is kind of a, a mixture of the two, bottom up and top down. <clears throat> so Big Bang is just. We just test everything in isolation. We test A by itself, B by itself, C by itself. Then the entire system is tested in one big step and we just test at the top level. Okay. This can be used for really small systems. You don't want to use this for large systems because it's going to be quite difficult or impossible to isolate problems when they when they arise. Because remember, one of the things that we're hoping for in testing is to find the faults that are there. We want to know that if faults are there, we're going to find them. Well, sometimes, a lot of times in Big Bang integration testing, a fault occurs, but we have no clue where it is. Right. So if we look at it from a diagram perspective, 
we test each component by itself, and then we test them all together, and we're done. No, you don't. I, you'll have to wait. Uh, actually, hold on just a second. OK, sorry about that. Uh, my son is home and asking for stuff. OK. So. So OK, where was I? Big Bang integration testing. All right, so what we do with that is. Um, we test each individual component by itself, and then uh, after that we uh, we test uh, all of it all together okay again small systems can use it it is a um, it is a uh, it is a problem that when faults show up that uh, they'll be hard to spot they'll be hard to track down exactly where they are okay so this is probably what um, I would say bottom up integration where, where we each we test each unit at the bottom first and then we put them together and then we test up and we test up and we test up until everything is tested. So if we look at this, a bottom up integration test would look like this. We test E by itself first, we test F, we test G. Then we test B by testing E and F with it because B calls E and F, so we need to test the three of them kind of together, make sure they integrate well. We test C by itself, we test D and G, and then we finally can test all of them together. OK. Yeah. Let me excuse me for just a second again. OK, and OK, so bottom up, we finish that. All right, so. It's really appropriate for object oriented systems. Bottom up has some some disadvantages that are listed here. Um, top level components are usually the most important in terms of what the user sees first, right? It's what gets called first. The main method is what gets called first, but yet we're testing it last. Um, and so we have to wait till the very end to even show anything um, to our to our users a lot of times. Uh, so uh, there's some other disadvantages here as well so uh, that you can take a look at. So top down, if bottom up is do the smallest component first and move up, top down just does the exact opposite. We test the top level first and then we call the, the ones down below. Um, and then we test the ones down below after we're finished testing the top level. Uh, so the diag like as, as a diagram like this, we would test A by itself, then we would test A, B, and C, D together, then we would test the whole system together. It looks more simple. It looks like, oh wow, this is much more simple and easier to do, like fewer tests. You know, it's like we have only testing some of this and then this, and there's only three cells here. But one of the big disadvantages is that if A calls B, and we're testing A, but we don't know if B works yet, what, how do we do that? All right. Well, the way that we get around that is a lot, is what we'll usually do is we will, where does it say it? It's on the next slide. Yeah. Right. We, we will write method stubs. 
Okay, let's see. Is it on this one here? Uh, I guess it's on this slide we're talking. I thought it introduced slides on the previous slide. <clears throat> so the idea of a stub is we write a, 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 a method that returns a correct value. And, it, and what I mean by a correct value is not the correct value itself, the answer, but rather a correct data type. So for example, if Say we wanted to have a method called is leap year, like we were writing a calendar routine, and, and we wanted to know if the year we're in is a leap year. Okay, and you know how to calculate a leap year. If it's divisible by four, then it's a leap year. Unless it's divisible by a hundred, then it's not a leap year. Unless it's divisible by four hundred, in which it is, in which, in which case it is a leap year. All right. So like two thousand was a leap year because it was divisible by 400, so that made it a leap year. 2004 was a leap year. 2020 was a leap year. 2019, not a leap year. Uh, 1900, not a leap year, All right, Because it was divisible by four, but it was also divisible by 100, OK? So these are all examples of leap years and not leap years. Now, we could write a very simple is, is a leap year method, right? But a stub just says, OK, we're going to have a, me a method. Right? Um, right Boolean is leap year and it's going to take uh, it's going to take an integer. Parameter. Right? And a stub would say, OK, what we're going to do is we're just going to. Um, my typing is terrible today. Return true. Done. OK, that's a stub. It means we're not very much interested in making sure that the functionality is correct, but we want that if a if let's say C was that is leap year method. If A calls C, it gets it. It finds a method called C, and it gets a return value from C that it's expecting. That's all we're that's all we care about in a method stub. Okay. So the problem is, is that well, what if the result of C gets used as input to an if statement or a while loop in A? Well. Let's say it's a while loop that as long as C is true, A is going to continue doing some stuff. Well, if we have a method stub like this that returns true, we, we just got ourselves into an infinite loop, right? So the need for method stubs can cause a big problem in certain types of systems, okay? And again, the correctness of the stub will influence the validity of the test itself. All right. So these are some of the problems that might exist with top down integration. So I'll put a little note here. OK, so some modified might be OK. Test A. Test B, C and D alone, then test them together. That can help with some of that, but it's still again, if a if, a, if some of A's functionality depends on what the value returned from some of these other sub components are, we can end up with some problems, right? And then sandwich is kind of a mixture of the top up and top down and bottom up. All right, it's called sandwich integration, where the idea is we test, right? So we test here the bottom and the top first. And then we test the combinations. So here we're first going to test E, F, and G. So the bottom stuff, the leaf nodes, and we test A by itself. Then we can test B, E, and F together, and we can test D and G together, and then we test all of these together. Right. By dividing these things out into their different components and testing them like testing E by itself, F by itself, B, E and F together. 
uh, one of the advantages that we get is when errors are found, we can isolate where the problem is. If we just wait until everything's put together and we try to test the whole system all at once, one big shot, like the Big Bang integration, it becomes harder to pinpoint where the problems are. Um, so it's 3.30 now. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm about halfway through this set of slides, so I feel like this is probably a good place for us to stop, uh, especially since, yeah. Unfortunately, some of you guys weren't able to come today, but that's okay. Uh, is there any questions? Oh, one thing, I don't remember who it was, asked for uh, an extension on that homework assignment. I can extend that. What, I'm, what I'll do is I'll extend that by three days. I'll go ahead and extend the deadline by three days, but I still have a follow-up assignment I want to give as well, so I won't delay giving that next assignment. Okay, so I'll, what I'll end up doing is giving the next assignment while the old while the first one is still not deadline passed yet. Okay. Will we be given a uh, homework about uh, J unit J unit programming? Uh, I would like to. I would like to give uh, an assignment related to that, but I would like to go over the J unit stuff um, in more detail first. So okay. I may end up not being able to do that. So we'll we'll I'll take a look at it and we'll see if I can give an assignment related to it. OK, about uh, term papers, I think this is last meeting before our presentations, right? Uh, let me take a look. I, I hope I hope not. It Let's is. See. We are supposed to present on 8 to 14 January. Oh, is that right? Oh, you. Um, okay, I have on the syllabus uh, presentations on the fifteenth. I have uh, software and object-oriented metrics on the eighth, and then presentations on the fifteenth. Okay. Yeah. Is that then right? on ninth January we will meet, and then next week we will present. Yep, that'll be the plan. Okay. Uh, may I ask something about my term paper? Sure. Uh, as I asked you through chat, I wanted to write a wider in a wider way, but also when I started writing, I have seen uh, a lot of failure stories about soft. I mean, bad soft uh, caused by bad, bad software. I mean, mm -hmm. like airplane crashes, uh, exploded rockets, and such things. If mm -hmm. I write uh, only about these failures, would it be very boring, or would it be okay? I, I don't think it would be boring, because if anything, I, I think, um, I can't remember who said it, but there are people talking about that, um, there's a saying that we learn more from failure than we do from success. Um, Actually, I'm going to post a link to a uh, uh, a blog post that talks about that very thing in software. Uh, I think we can learn a lot more from uh, failures. Hopefully, we can learn from other people's failures, and we cannot repeat the same mistakes. So I think that f talking about failures can be very, uh, very informative. Okay, what about the length, actually? In term paper, you say from six pages to ten pages, but you don't uh, indicate any word number. So what if we use big uh, font or we use pictures? Um, Isn't it better yeah. to give a word number, actually? I, I don't really care. It's not about the word number. I think I said it was in the IEEE double column format. Isn't that what I said? Let's see. Uh, where did I put it? Not there. I copy paste it here. Okay, let's see. Or 
Yeah, the two column I triple E format. So yeah, I, I mean, you, one of the ways that you can get some extra space on a, on pages is by using figures. I, I wouldn't go overboard on using lots of figures and images, but uh, definitely I would expect to see some figures and uh, graphs and images and stuff like that. So, but as far as the word count, that's not really as important. It needs to be the in the the two column I triple E format. I believe that's a font twelve. Uh, you sh do you know how to use a? Some people call it latex. Some people call it LaTeX. Uh, it's yeah, the, I, uh, I checked it. Okay, that you should be able to find a a, a template, an I triple E template, I triple E transactions dot CLS. Uh, so you should be able to use that uh, to be able to write your paper with. Okay, then as I understood, uh, length is not very much strict. No, it just the reason why I give a length like six to ten is I want to make sure that you've at least done done your work in putting an, enough valuable information in there. Uh, there's a uh, there's basically I, I want. I want you to have a lot of valuable information. I don't want you to write a bunch of junk in there just to get some extra pages, you know? Yeah, okay. And presentation will be 20 to 30 minutes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, there's, I believe, six of you, no, let's see, there's six of you registered to the class. Uh, let's see, there's one, two, three. So there's four of you registered to the class. So if each of you takes 20 to 30 minutes, it should be about two hours. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, th thank you for asking those questions. I'm sure the others would like to know that stuff as well. I thank you for answers too. Sure. All right. Well, if you if you guys have if any of the other rest of you have other questions as well, um, just let me know offline. And other than that, uh, Tahir, if you have any other questions, we can talk about that now too. But other than that, I'll go ahead and end the meeting. I think that's all for now. Thank you. Okay. Well, have a good uh, New Year's and try every everyone try to stay healthy and <sighs> stay safe. Let's get Thank through you. this. Now that we have the vaccine, maybe we can get through this faster. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you by now. It's oh, yeah. Week. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, that's uh, a week from today, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Well, have a happy new year. Thank you. See you later. Thank you.